Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. Uh, before we dive into things, I just have a couple of quick housekeeping notes and community guidelines to mention. So if you have any sound or technical issues today, please let me know in the chat box with a direct message and I'll do my best to help you out. This webinar is being recorded and the recording, um, as well as a PDF of the slideshow and a couple of additional resources is going to be sent out to all registrants probably within the next week or so. Um, we will be doing a brief Q&A at the end of the presentation, but please feel free to send your questions throughout the chat box at any time, and then we'll go through them all uh, when we get to that portion. Uh, and finally, we ask that you hold each other with mutual respect, come to this space teachable, and please stay engaged with our presenter throughout this program. So now I just want to share a little bit about the Documentary Heritage Preservation Services for New York program, for those of you that may not be aware of us. Uh, DIPSNY, as we like to call ourselves, is a collaboration between the New York State Archives and the New York State Library with services provided by the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts. DIPSNY is a statewide program that provides free planning and education services to support the vast network of collecting institutions such as archives, libraries, historical societies, museums, and other organizations that safeguard and ensure access to New York's historical records and library research materials. DIPSNY services include archival needs assessments, preservation and condition surveys, strategic planning assistance, and access to a variety of educational programs, such as this webinar. So to learn more about any of our services, you can visit us at dhpsny.org. And with that, I'm going to pass things over to today's speaker, Jen, to get us started. Thank you so much and welcome everyone. I'm so glad that you're all here to spend about an hour talking about planning for digital preservation. Um, so let's just jump right in. All right, so first, just a little bit about me and where I'm coming from and my experience with digital preservation. I am the Digital Services Manager at the Southeastern New York Library Resources Council. We are one of nine of the multi-type library systems in New York State that make up the Empire State Library Network. So I operate out of the Hudson Valley region, um, but we've, you know, our sister councils, uh, among all nine of us, we have the state covered. So you might be familiar with your council. Um, and we provide a variety of services to our member libraries, which are academic libraries, special libraries, uh, hospital libraries, uh, the school and public library systems are members of our councils um, and museums, historical societies, et cetera. So we really have um, a diverse uh, group of membership. And we, again, provide a variety of services to them. What I've been involved with my whole entire time here at Southeastern is our digitization services. So for the last five years, I've helped our members upload collections to New York Heritage. Um, but before that, in the Hudson Valley, we had a regional digital repository called Hudson River Valley Heritage VH. So for 20 years, I have been supporting our members um, through digitization projects. And New York Heritage and HRVH before it, uh, were, it are an access project. So that's what we were really focused on was um, providing access to uh, resources. And um, But most of the digital projects that we work on involve creating pretty high resolution um, files. So like TIFFs for images or WAV files for audio, but we don't upload those files to the online repository. We convert those TIFFs to JPEGs, we convert those WAVs to MP3s, and that's what we're presenting. Um, and starting at the beginning, we it was like our members' responsibility to care for um, all of their files, including those master files. Um, so what we noticed over some years, as it turns out, that managing, storing, preserving digital files is not that easy. So um, a number of years ago, we launched a digital dark archive service um, to better support our members in preserving the files that they've dedicated resources to creating through these digitization projects. So, um, so that's where my experience lies, is mostly with digitized archival and special collections. Um, so those are the types of content and files that we're storing. Um, it is a dark archive, meaning it's not publicly accessible. We're using Amazon Glacier as the storage, um, but we're providing more than just a backup. So we're not just taking files and putting them in this cloud storage. We first process them using a piece of software called Archivematica that does some digital preservation um, processes on the files. So it'll duplicate the file. Um, it extracts metadata from the file. It validates that the file format is 
actually what it says it is, um, and it assigns checksums to the file. So if you're not familiar with a checksum is, this is about as technical as I'm going to get today. <laughs> a checksum is a unique identifier assigned to a file. Um, you, you generate it through pieces of software. We use Archivematica, there's other ones, and that is like referred to as a digital fingerprint for that file. And so you can run your files through a software later, and if that number has changed, then you know that this, something has happened with your file. So, um, so those are the kinds of things we're doing. Uh, my systems manager here at Southeastern, Zach Spaulding, takes care of all of the technical side, but I work with contributors on the other side, like the planning, the selection for what goes in there, documenting what's going in there, things like that. So it's a team effort. Um, so, so again, I was just telling you that to, so you understand like where I'm coming from, I will refer back to um, our work periodically through this presentation. Um, and I do want to let you know this is not, you know, a, a pitch for the service, but uh, we this is available to members of other councils. So I want you to know that it exists. Right now, about three of the other councils have submitted member files to the Dark Archive, and a couple of our other sister councils have submitted institutional records. Um, so if you are interested in learning more, you can reach out to your council um, to learn more about that, or you can reach out directly to me. I will put my email uh, in the chat at the end. Um, so that's my background and where I'm coming from. Okay. So what we're going to do in the time that we have available is we are going to define digital preservation um, and we're going to identify some of the risks to preserving digital content. And then we're going to talk a lot about um, the non-technical sides of digital preservation, specifically planning, for the work, the documentation you need to support the work. I'm gonna briefly mention the standards at the end, some of the big standards in the field. And then I have some great resources for you um, to learn more, to further uh, your education and your practice in this field. And I'm gonna actually show you a couple of them and uh, you're gonna get a copy of the slides. I have links throughout on some of the other slides as well, which we're not gonna look at. It's just links uh, for more information about that specific topic. Um, so you'll get a copy and then you can click on all those links, okay? So the first thing I wanna do is just share a couple definitions with you of digital preservation to kind of lay a foundation for what I'm gonna talk about in the next 30, 40 minutes or so. Um, so here are two, they're pretty brief. The first one is digital preservation, combines policies, strategies, and actions that ensure access to digital content over time. And this definition comes from the American Library Association. And uh, speaking of digital preservation, I could not find the webpage <laughs> that hosts the, this definition anymore. Um, and when they first developed the, this definition, it was back in 2007, and they actually had a short definition a medium definition and a longer definition. This is obviously the short one. Um, again, I could not find it on the web anywhere. I could find a bazillion references to this page on the web. Um, so I linked to it from uh, the Internet Archives Wayback Machine. So again, you can click on it, you can read the short definition and read the more detailed definitions that kind of unpack what this means, what policies, strategies, actions, uh, a little more detail around that. My other definition that I want to share with you, which is my absolute favorite one, comes from Trevor Owens, who used to work at the Library of Congress for a long time. He is kind of a rock star in this field, and he wrote a wonderful book called The Theory and Craft of Digital Preservation, and uh, there is an online version. I think it's an older edition. Um, you can buy the book, <laughs> but uh, you can find this version online through the link on my slide, but he says, digital preservation is a continual process of understanding the risks you face of losing content or losing the ability to render and interact with it and then making use of whatever resources you have to mitigate those risks. Okay, I love this definition because it pulls out that it's a continual process and it's about continually understanding the risk you face because things change rapidly in the world of digital content as we all know and then making whatever uh, resources you have available. And the resources look very different in different types of organizations. So what do you have? Uh, what do you need to preserve? How can you do this? And it's just a continual process. So this is kind of what we're gonna talk about today is what this looks like. So Trevor talks about the risks and understanding what those are. So let's just take a little moment 
to identify what those risks are to digital content. Um, there's a lot of them. So, um, and we might not need to spend a lot of time on this slide because I'm sure we've all seen some of this in our personal and professional lives. I know I have both in my personal life, my professional life, and, and absolutely working with 80 institutions over 20 years on building digital collections. I've seen data go missing um, for almost all of these reasons. And sometimes it's just one corrupted file from a, you know, a um, scrapbook that was scanned 20 years ago and now one file can't open anymore to hundreds or thousands of files being lost for more of these reasons. So, and I'm sure you've probably seen some of this as well. So these are the risks that we face with digital content that we need to be aware of and, in, um, and constantly thinking about so that we can move digital content through time. So, what does digital preservation require? It requires more than technology. Um, it is definitely a technical problem, but it's more than just a technical problem. So this is the way I like to think about it in terms of what's required. Um, it requires ongoing organizational commitment and resources. That's number one, okay? And it requires documentation. And we're gonna spend a good amount of time talking about the documentation that supports digital preservation, but it is really key to sustaining your efforts. And we're talking about policies, we're talking about plans, uh, we're talking about procedures. And, they, and these documents don't just support our current work, they are our love letter to the future. So um, they often say in digital preservation, it is a relay, not a sprint, you will be passing this work off to other people. And so the documentation is really important to um, allowing the people who come after us to pick up where we left off. So, and it also requires people, um, people with the time, the expertise and the authority to develop, maintain and implement those policies, plans and procedures. And of course it requires some technology. You can't do digital preservation without some technology. You need storage, you might need some processing tools and systems, um, but digital preservation is not just a technical problem like I just said. Technology doesn't preserve anything, people and organizations do. So the technology is going to come and go, and so are the people, which is why the first two are so important. So this is the way I like to think about it as this four-pronged approach, but often in the field, you will see it referred to as a three-legged stool. So I wanna share this with you because you will see it as you go and further your education around this, you'll see this referenced in a lot of other uh, resources. Um, so same concept, they just use three prongs and documentation is part of this. So you've got your organization leg, that is your policies and your plans, your procedures, your workflows and your people, right? And you've got resources. So ongoing and sustainable funding and staffing things change. So you constantly have to have resources available to, uh, to address the change as it comes. And that's money and that's people, right? Again, people are gonna come and go. So you gotta make sure you constantly have the staff to do the work. And then of course, technology. Um, you can't do it without that as well. But a lot of people wanna run out and um, implement technical solutions without thinking about the other two. And the technology solutions are hard to sustain without planning for the other two. Um, so I, we are going to talk about the non-technical side of this because it really supports everything you do. Okay, so as you begin to plan for digital preservation, one of the things you're gonna wanna do early on is go through an assessment process to assess where your organization is at right now. Um, because that's really important, again, for sustainability. So I work with people sometimes who they know, like I, I'm not working directly with administrators, um, decision makers, the people who control the purse strings. I tend to work with the people who are doing the digital work. And so they know the amount of digital content that they now have to manage. Um, but sometimes they have to raise awareness within their organization uh, before they can do anything else. So like, I know there's a problem, but I have to communicate <laughs> this problem with others and get the resources I need um, to address this. So organizational awareness is an early first step. And also looking at your organizational mandate, your mission. Um, so if you don't have preservation in your organizational mission, then that's gonna 
be a challenge to getting the resources you need. Um, if you do have preservation in your organizational mission, that is a really helpful um, you know, thing you can leverage to raise awareness and get uh, the resources you need. So because it does require that ongoing commitment from the organization at the organizational level. Um, you need to look at your current funding. There are ongoing costs. There are ways to do it at low cost. Um, there are free tools out there for processing. Storage isn't super expensive, but you know, if you're using hardware for storage, that will need to be replaced every five to seven years. So you've got to make sure that you're planning for those recurring costs. Your staff time and skills, where are you at right now in terms of the skill set you have and the people with the time, right? I work with a ton of people who are just strapped for time. So thinking about who you have in your organization, what your organizational structure is, who should have a role to play in digital preservation, um, and how you can give them the time to do it and build their skill set if they need to, to, to build their skill set. There's a lot of education that goes on in this. So maybe an early first step in terms of this is allocating some funds to get your staff educated. Um, and then you build out from there. So, and then also the technology, what is your store, current storage environment? Um, you know, how old are the computers in your institution? Do you need a dedicated workstation to do some of this work? So what do you have now? What do you need? But you need to think about all of this for now and then for the future. Um, so this is some of the early planning activities um, that you should do right away. And there are some assessment tools to walk you through um, how to think about this in your organization. Um, I have a couple links on my slide. One goes to the Digital Preservation Coalition. It just explains organizational readiness and how to think about that. And then I've also linked you to um, an actual like survey that you can work through uh, in your organization with, you know, by, by yourself if you're a small staff and you just want to get started, but, you know, see who your partners are within your organization and work through some of these tools together. My last slide has a couple other assessment tools that I'll show you at the end, um, but I just wanted to link to this one. It's a fairly old document, but it's literally a checklist and it gives you all the good things you need to think about in all of these categories. Um, so your funding, your staffing, your technology, those kinds of things, your existing documentation. Um, so but it's a really important, you gotta think holistically about this work. All right, so documentation, super, super, super important um, part of the process and to support your work. Um, you gotta write things down. Again, it helps you now and it really helps in the future. If you don't write things down, the people coming after you will have no idea what you did and why or how to pick up the baton that you're gonna pass to them. Um, and I'm going to run through this slide and explain what all of these are a little bit, and then we're going to take a deeper dive into some of them. Um, so the first thing you want to document is what you have, right? What kind of digital content do you have right now? Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about this. It's an incredibly important first step. If you take nothing away from this webinar, it's it's the inventory um, because everything flows from that. And so we're going to unpack that a little bit, what that means, what that looks like. Um, but you want to record what you have. You also want to develop some selection criteria. Not all your digital content needs to be preserved. Um, not all of it needs to be stored and managed the same way. Uh, so you need to know how to think through those decisions about what might meet the highest level of treatment, uh, where the priorities are for digital preservation. So we're gonna talk a little bit about selection criteria. And now oftentimes selection criteria is embedded in plans. Um, it's not necessarily a standalone document, but I wanted to pull it out separately because we are gonna talk about it. Um, you're gonna need policies. And uh, in an ideal world, and at some point, in the future, you will definitely want to develop a digital preservation policy. We're going to talk a little bit about what that means, what the components of a policy are, and I have some examples for you. Um, but in the meantime, if you're not ready for that, maybe some first steps are looking at existing documentation that you have and where you can insert um, digital preservation uh, into those. So like your collection development and management policies. That would be a great place to address digital collections um, and preserving them if you don't already have that there. A very simple first thing you can do is look at your deed of gift. 
if you are in an archival or historical repository and you take in collections, um, I'm sure you're seeing more digital donations. Sometimes they're born digital resources. Sometimes they're family or organizational resources where that entity wants to keep the physical but give you digital copies. So you're getting digital stuff. Um, so if you're not addressing digital uh, materials and digital preservation in your deed of gift, you should be. Because one of the things of preserving um, digital files is you're going to want to make copies of those files, right? You might want to um, migrate them to different formats. You're going to have to like care for them over time. And that means doing things to them. So just making it very clear to donors what that means. So that's a, but it's a great place to write something down. And then that kind of starts to solidify this work at the organizational level. So look at your deed of gift, that's an early first step and start to make some um, changes to that to address digital content and digital preservation if you need to. Again, in an ideal world and at some point in the future, you're gonna want a digital preservation plan. And if you're not ready for that yet, then look at some of the other plans that you might have like a disaster recovery plan. Are you talking, are you addressing your digital collections there? If not, that could be a good place to insert some language um, about making sure that those files are managed and stored and um, recoverable, usable in the future. Um, I wanna talk about strategic planning here as well, because if you're very new to this um, and your organization is coming up on a strategic planning process, then that could be a good way to start to address um, digital preservation at the organizational level and kind of map out the next few years of how you're going to um, tackle this in your organization. Um, Dipsney does provide, a little shout out to Dipsney, does provide strategic planning assistance. Um, and I think their application for the next round is open and due sometime in November. So uh, just take a look at that, think about that. You're gonna wanna document your workflows. Um, sometimes higher level workflows are included in a plan. Uh, so if you get to the, that, that point of you have a plan, I want to document your workflows in that plan. Um, but the reason I pulled it out is because I'm talking not just about kind of higher level workflows of how you move certain things through, um, through the process, but step-by-step -step instructions for whatever software you might uh, use in your workflows, you're going to want to document those, again, for the people in your organization who are helping you now and also for the future. So lots of documentation. And also job descriptions, right? Um, I only know of two people in my whole region who actually have digital preservation in their job titles, and they're both fairly new positions. Um, more often than not, when you're getting started, you're going, this work will be done by people who do not have digital preservation in their job titles or in their job descriptions. Um, so once you get started and you're doing some work and you kind of identify the roles in your organization who will be doing this work, you're gonna wanna look at the job descriptions for those roles in your organization and make sure they address um, digital preservation. Because again, this is just a way to solidify this work in your organization, that this is something we do and these are the people in our organization who do it. And last, but certainly not least, and we talked about this on a previous slide, is your organizational mission. Um, you're gonna wanna take a look at that. And if um, you don't, if preservation isn't in your mission, then you need to kind of consider how this work fits in. Um, but if you, it just might be time to, to change that. And if you're, are dealing with lots of digital content that needs to be preserved for the long term, then you might want to make that part of your mission and it's written down again. Just making this um, really an organizational commitment over time. So these are the pieces of documentation that can help you do that and that you should work towards as you do this work. All right, so now we're going to talk about um, the digital content inventory as a very early document that you can create and that you should create. Um, and it should be one of the first things you do. So again, if you take nothing from this webinar, I want it to be this, go forth an inventory. <laughs> um, so why would you create an inventory? It is a great management planning and advocacy tool. You can't plan for what you're gonna do with digital content until you have a good sense of what you have. Um, so that is the very first step. It helps you plan everything that comes out of that. Um, and it also can be a good advocacy tool. So 
and you might not be able to tackle everything in your organization. You might have a huge organization with multiple departments, lots of people creating digital content that your organization needs to preserve over time. Um, ideally, you'd want to assemble a team across departments to look at this together um, and kind of collaborate on this effort. Um, if you can't get there yet, then just start with the content that you're responsible for. So if you work in an archives or special collections in a larger institution and you know you got a lot of stuff, get it inventoried, because then that can go, you can use that to raise awareness in the rest of your organization um, for what you're dealing with. And then other people will likely be like, oh yeah, I need to, <laughs> I've got some issues too. I need to think about the files that I'm in, responsible for. So good advocacy tool and, and planning and management. Gotta know what you have. Um, it helps you establish an intellectual control over your digital collections. And it also serves as an internal finding aid um, for your organization's digital content. Because even if you have things pretty well organized and, and saved in one place, um, other people might not know what you have, right? And one of the good um, kind of principles of digital preservation is limiting access to your preservation copies. So you don't want them stored in a place that a lot of people have access to. So the inventory is a way to just make everybody aware of what you have. Um, and so how do you do this? Spreadsheets are great. Um, you can use a database. I recommend a spreadsheet over like a word processing document because spreadsheets allow you to filter on different pieces of information. Um, so I created one here at Southeastern to kind of model the process for my members. And also because we have access to a lot of our members content. Um, we loan scanners and laptops to do digital projects. We have for a long time. Uh, I have a scanner here that people can come use. Our loaners go out with hard drives. Uh, in the last few years, we've been doing more uploading for our members. So sometimes we get copies of files directly from vendors. Um, so I, it was a really great exercise. I have the benefit of the institutional memory. I've been here doing this work for 20 years. So I knew where all of those things were stored. And so I created a spreadsheet. Um, and of course, mine's going to be a little different because I have to have the, the name of the holding institution in there. Um, and then I, you know, I described the content. Um, but we went and we looked at, we have external drives, we've got laptops, we've got the computer in the scanning room, we've got my computer and my coworker, Kelsey, who does some uploading and cataloging for people. Um, so it was a wonderful exercise and it has actually been an incredibly helpful tool since we created it. Um, and we've moved some of that content into our dark archive, um, but others uh, we've just delivered back to the organization. And, uh, but it's been a great, tool to see what we have and to work with our members on. Um, in some cases, we were we had the only copies left and we were able to provide them copies back. So let's unpack this a little more, what we mean by an inventory. So on this slide are some of the pieces of information you're, you're gonna wanna record. You need to make this inventory work for you. Um, don't get stuck thinking it has to be perfect or or look like what everybody else's does, you know, it, it might stray a little bit from organization to organization, but generally speaking, here are some of the things that most inventories will have. And you do this at the group level. You're not doing file by file. So you're identifying content by groups. Um, so you're going to want to name that group. You know, does it have a collection name or a project name uh, or just a folder name, if that's all you've got. A brief description of the group. If you know, again, I had the institutional memory. I knew what all the, this content was and the projects they came from, um, but describe it as best you can if it was done before you. You're going to want to record all of the current storage locations. So is it on a hard drive, external hard drive on, in somebody's desk? Is it on, you know, what computer is it on? Is it in a network shared storage? Is it in Google Drive? Is it in Dropbox? Um, and if it's in multiple locations, you're going to want to document them all. And then it might also be a good idea if you do have copies of those files online somewhere in New York Heritage or in your own repository or in Flickr, wherever they may be, document that as well. Um, the file formats in that group, uh, the number of files in the group, and how much storage size that that group is currently taking up. And you can express that in megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes, whatever is relevant. And then the creation date of the digital files. That's really important because um, as files age, you're going to want to prioritize those if they're older files. So you want to, if you can get that information, you're going to want to record that. Now in the digitization world, some people will record the dates of the original materials as well, because that can kind of clue people into how fragile those originals might be. And that comes into play when you're talking about selection of um, 
digital files for preservation. Some of those very older materials you might not want to scan again. Um, they might be fragile, so you want to to know what what the originals are like, so you know how to prioritize the digital versions. Now, some other things you might want to record. Is the person or department responsible for the creation and management of those files? Again, if you work in a larger organization with different departments and you've got lots of people managing different types of content, you might want to record who's responsible for that, those files. Whether the resources were born digital or digitized, generally speaking, we prioritize born digital files over digitized. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit more. And any technological dependencies. So you might have files that were created using a very specific piece of software, and that software is required to render them. You're going to want to document that. Okay. And then you can assign broad categories, you know, like by types of content, audio, video, images, newspapers, if you've digitized a bunch of newspapers. Um, and then you even broader categories, whether they're organizational records, whether they are archives or special collections, is it research data, um, things like that. And then file naming is super important when it comes to digital preservation. We have found in our workflows that we often have to go back and rename files. Uh, we we package files together for the for our digital dark archive, um, and they go together and kind of like one. It's like a zip file, um, not exactly a zip file, but uh, so they're all together, and uh, the folder structure gets lost. So like if we've done diary projects and we just have you know file names that are like page one, page two, page three, and this diary, and page one, page two, page three, and this diary, we can't put them all together. So we've had to go use some batch file naming tools to um, you know put put prefixes onto those file names. So as you're doing your inventory, if you need some file naming cleanup, if you've got file names that have lots of special characters in them, that's not good for preservation. So just record that you might need to clean up some file names. And then any copyright issues. Um, if you don't have the rights to content, it doesn't make sense to spend the resources to preserve them. Doesn't mean you get rid of them, just doesn't mean they might not be warrant the full level of treatment. Okay, so again, go inventory. It is an approachable task. It takes some time. It took me about four days to get through everything. Um, you might need to plan for the inventory. Again, you might need to assemble a team. You might need to talk to some people, figure out what tool you're gonna use, figure out your criteria and who's gonna help you get that information if you don't have access to all the places that um, content is stored. But this should be a very, very, very early step um, and everything flows from here. So super important document. And it should be updated. This isn't a one and done. This should always, um, this file should be maintained as you add um, new digital content, whether you acquire it, whether you create it, you should always be updating the inventory with the new content and any actions you've taken on content should be recorded as well. So really important. So I wanna talk a little bit about selection criteria. Um, Again, it should be documented. Oftentimes you see them, so maybe a higher level kind of, we preserve this type of content might be in a policy and a plan might take a little deeper dive into um, like selection matrices or uh, flow charts, how you make these decisions. Um, but here are some of the general things you wanna think about. Like what is the value of this content to your organization? What does it mean for your organization if this content is lost? Um, so that could be intellectual value, it could be historical value, and it could also be monetary value. I work with members who have um, outsourced digitization, spent thousands of dollars to a vendor to get this stuff digitized. So they don't wanna lose that investment. Um, grant funded projects, funders want to know uh, how you're going to preserve those files with the money they give you. So there's a monetary value assigned to some of this, these files as well. Like what's the quality? Um, when I'm talking to my members, I'm like, you know, maybe those JPEGs that were scanned 20 years ago at 150 DPI, you know, aren't, aren't worth putting in the digital dark archive. They're not worth that three copies on two storage medium with one stored on site. You keep a copy, you back them up, but maybe not um, worthy of digital preservation. So, but those high quality TIFFs scanned by the vendors, absolutely. How unique is the content? Um, is this the only version of this content that exists? Those will be higher prioritized. Um, what's at risk? You know, both file formats and those original formats. So in the digitization world, um, you know, we've digitized a lot of old tape audio and video, those original formats are at risk. Um, so 
those digital files are now really important and should be prioritized over maybe the postcards, right? If, you know, doesn't mean you can't put your, your digitized postcards in the full digital preservation treatment system, um, but they might not be the highest priority if you've got other things that are more at risk and, and more unique. Again, copyright, something that should be considered. And then what is your capacity to preserve this information? How feasible is it for your organization to preserve this type of file. Um, so you're going to want to think about all that. What are your current tools? What is your current um, storage? Do these files require a special software to be rendered that you don't have? Um, all those decisions go into play. And on this slide, I have an example of a decision tree. I've linked to a couple of them, actually. So you can actually see a flow chart that kind of walks you through these. And you answer this question. If it's yes, you do this. If it's no, you do this. They're great resources. Um, so go check them out. Okay, so digital preservation policy is something you're going to want to um, develop at some point when you're ready. And a preservation policy is kind of a higher level policy. It's not as detailed as a full plan, but it generally states why you're preserving and it should be tied to your mission, um, why you're doing this, why digital preservation is important, what you are preserving. Um, and again, that can be higher level, don't have to be very nitty gritty, but we are preserving um, research data. You know, if you're at a at an academic archive or you know electronic theses and dissertations, you can like spell it out like that of what you preserve, um, and for whom you are preserving, who is your community that you're preserving for, who are your stakeholders. You're going to want to spell that out, and then very high level roles and responsibilities. Not too detailed, and you're not naming any names here. Um, just the the roles within your organization that are responsible for digital preservation. And I've linked here to a wonderful webinar uh, presented by Amy Rudersdorf, who works for the AV Preserve. She worked for the Digital Public Library of America for a while. Um, she's Fabulous. I've been following her career for a long time since she was at North Carolina. And this is a very, very, very well presented and approachable um, webinar on digital preservation policies. Highly recommend. And then I linked you to kind of a template document from Orbis Cascade Alliance out west, and then two examples of digital preservation policies that I thought were um, very approachable, very absorbable, absorbable, not too long. Um, so you can go check those out. Again, at some point, you're going to want to have a plan. Um, might not be ready to do a full plan yet. Sometimes it takes a little testing, figuring everything else out. But at some point, you're going to want to have a plan. And plans are just more detailed um, documents that really describe the content you're preserving and your, ac your action plans um, for different types of content. Like we do this with AV. Um, we do this with image files and the actual workflows and the technology that you're using in those workflows. And here you're going to get a little more detailed with roles and responsibilities. Um, in your policy, you're just going to list them. These are the people who are you know, responsible for digital preservation. And again, here you're not going to name any names, but you're going to say what that role does in that process. Um, I didn't link to any here. There's a ton out there. If you just do a web search for digital preservation plan, you'll find a ton of them. OK, so that's my presentation on the documentation. Again, I think the inventory is the really important first step and I encourage you all to start planning for that if you're very new to this or if you've started to play around with some tools and some workflows and, but you haven't done that piece, you might wanna backtrack and go do that piece um, first because it is everything flows from there. But I want to mention um, just a couple of the standards in the field. I didn't wanna start with these. Or did I want to take too much of a deep dive because they can be um, be a little intimidating <laughs> to get started. Uh, so, and there are more standards in the field. These are kind of the two big ones. Um, and one is the OAIS, and it is a reference model for what digital preservation kind of looks like. Um, and it's not just technical, right? It includes management and planning, um, but they have these these actual graphic models and they're just really scary. So, but I want you to know it exists because you will see it referenced in other resources as you move through your education. Um, and I wanted to point you to a great explanation of it from the Digital Power folks, which I'm gonna share a little more about their website in just a minute. Um, but in this webinar, they, they 
they clearly explain it in very approachable terms. Um, and they also tell you if you're a small under-resourced organization not to worry about it, which is really helpful um, because other people have worried about it for you. And oftentimes the tools and services you might use have incorporated this standard into what they're doing. So you can get the benefits of this standard without really needing to know a lot about it, but you will see it referenced. So I just want you to know it exists and just take a few minutes and watch that webinar. And then the other one is premise, which is the metadata standard for digital preservation. Um, digital preservation does require uh, a lot of metadata and premise records information about the objects, um, about the agents, um, interacting with those objects. So those are people, their organizations, their systems, and then events. So any actions you're taking on that digital content. And that premise stores all of that information. Um, and oftentimes, again, tools you might uh, insert into your workflow will do some of this for you. So you're, you're not going to really sit there and create all of that. Um, you'll use tools that will extract data from the files and, for you and, and package it in a in a premise record. But I do want you to know it exists um, because again, it will be incorporated into tools and you will see it referenced out there. So I just linked to an introduction for you. So I wanna save time for questions. Um, we're almost done. So I have some other resources here for you. And again, you will get access to these slides, um, but I wanna show you a couple of them not all of them, but I want to show you um, a couple of them and how they can be helpful to you. And I already have them opened. So I'm going to go ahead and my slideshow right now. Um, and we'll walk through one of them. So the first is the Digital Preservation Handbook from the Digital Preservation Coalition. Um, the Digital Preservation Coalition website, if you click here and get to their main site, it's a wealth of information. They have a whole section on how to implement digital preservation that can be very helpful. Talks about policies and plans, um, making the business case. There's so much good information for you there, but the handbook is a great place to start, um, specifically the um, digital preservation briefing and the getting started section and the organizational activities. So just start there and it gives you a good foundation for what's to come. Okay. Um, I also linked you to a, a webinar playlist from the Digital Preservation Coalition. These webinars were um, presented in the spring and they're actually on um, different workflows. So people in the field came and presented on how they're actually doing this. Um, so because I didn't provide that for you because how you do it looks really different in different organizations, I just wanna refer you here because it can be very educational just to see um, what other people are doing, the tools they're using, um, some of them have flow charts of their workflows. Um, there's things in here on email archiving and website archiving, if that is something you need to um, do in your institution. But then there's also a suite of them that are more in the like digitized special collections. Um, so if that's where you're coming from, there's some really good webinars in there as well. Okay. This one, fabulous, fabulous, fabulous community, the digital power people. Power stands for preserving digital objects with restricted resources. It's just for um, organizations that don't have a lot of money and time and people to do this and how you can get started um, and how you can do this work. So one of the things I want to point you to here, um, they have these institutes. It's uh, I went back in 2018, 19 to one of these institutes and it was two full days of intensive training. Um, you work with a cohort you get a faculty advisor, you, uh, you get like group sessions with your advisor, uh, you get a one-on-one -on -one session with an expert to talk about your specific use cases and needs. Um, and then also a bunch of presentations, both on the theory and you get some work on the practice. They will train you on some of the um, free, easy to use tools for digital preservation at this institute. It's fabulous. So there is one coming up. Um, in 2025, so you should keep an eye out for the application to open. You apply and the, there's no fee to attend. I think you have to get there, but I'll talk about how you can get support for that in just a minute. Um, so great, Take. I, I hope they get more funding to do more institutes. It was incredibly helpful for me when I went. Um, but over on the resources tab, I wanna show you 
I've linked to a couple webinars of theirs on my slides, but here's a few more that really help set the stage um, and get you started. I highly recommend watching them. But also on the resources tab, if you click I Survived a Power Institute, um, all of the presentations from past institutes are available here. And then they also list the tools that they teach on. Um, so this is, can be just a great resource to get a little bit of more theory and some practice. All right. And then they also have this tool grid. So again, my presentation wasn't very technical because I think all those other things are, are just as important at this, as the tools you use, but you can come to their tool grid and then you can see all of the available software and services available to support digital preservation and what they do. Right, so some tools just do one or two or three things really well, some do a whole suite of things. So this can be a really great resource for evaluating the tools that are out there for you. All right, so there's that one. Okay, Digital Preservation Outreach and Education Network. This, is, um, this program has been around a long time. It was originally run out of the Library of Congress and it was a training program that went around the country and trained people on digital preservation. Um, it is now at, I think the Pratt Institute maintains this now. Um, but what I want you to know here is um, they have some funding available. So they have professional development funding. Um, so if you wanted to, if you got accepted to a power institute or if you want to attend some training and conferences or webinars that cost money, you can apply for grants and get that paid for. Um, and I think it's up to $2,500 per person. So uh, if you're limited on resources to get your staff trained, this could be a great resource. They also have emergency hardware support. This is only available through December of this year. Um, so I would never recommend <laughs> running out and like purchasing some equipment until you've done some of these other things that we talked about today. But because this is only available through December, I wanted you to know about, about it. You can get um, a hard drive. So you can get uh, a RAID device that has redundant storage. They're really big, one's 12 terabytes, one's 16. Or you can just get a little hard drive. Um, so think about what you might need right now. If you're not ready to start moving files um, in the next year or so, then maybe this isn't the great greatest resource right now. Um, but if you think you're going to start moving files off of you know, your ex all the places they exist onto a central storage device in the next year, um, then you can go ahead and, and get this. At least you get your first one for free. But remember, our drives need to be replaced every five to seven years. So make sure that you are planning for how to sustain that and purchase new hardware, okay? But this is a great resource and available to you. Um, they also um, aggregate training opportunities. So lots of different, um, gotta wait for the air table to load. Uh, and it doesn't want to load, but lots of different um, training opportunities out there for digital preservation you can find here. There we go. Um, so great resource for knowing where you can learn more. And then okay, I'm going to skip over the level of preservation right now. It's another assessment tool, but it's really on the technical side of things. Um, I've linked to it. It's here, um, but I want to save time for questions. So we're going to finish on this one, which is from the Northeast Document Conservation Center. And it is, again, another assessment tool um, that you can use. It's really designed to be peer-to-peer. -peer, so you would work with another peer organization and you would do this together. Uh, but if you're not ready for that, I think it's still a great resource to use on your own within your own organization because um, it runs you through all of kind of the planning activities and asks you a series of questions. Um, for thinking about digital preservation in all of those areas, your organization, your technology, your resources, um, your staff, and your documentation. So just a great resource for learning more. And I know I talked very fast because I was trying to get through and leave time for questions. Um, so that is the end of my presentation. Uh, you can only really scratch the surface in 45 minutes on a very, very big, heady topic. Um, but I hope I have given you some things to think about, some things you can do next, and some good resources for learning more.